honor to be here today to share ideas on how we can all flourish in the new paradigm. Many of us here in this room today have embraced complementary ideas of health and wellness, including the idea of eating healthy, right? Probably most, if not all of us, try to eat healthy when we can. But what does eating healthy really mean? Does it mean staying away from what doctors tell us is bad? In other words, staying away from high saturated fat, salt, and sodium? and instead eating Brussels sprouts? Does it mean delaying our gratification when we want to eat pizza? Because that's what we really want to eat, right, is pizza. Well, unfortunately, in the US, the medical establishment has focused on the negative in eating healthy. And they make us fearful. We label food as good or bad for us. So today, I'm going to show you why pizza can be good for you. And I want to challenge you to think about eating healthy in a more positive way in a way that can heal your body and feed your soul. So over 10 years ago, I had a satellite medical practice here in Malibu. And on my way into the office, I would often stop off at this local grocery on the Pacific Coast Highway and pick up foods. I'd wander around trying to decide what I wanted to eat. And uh, so I stopped back in a couple days ago and snapped this picture. And what I saw with, was that a lot of the foods for sale are the same. But what's different? was that I had changed, my attitude towards food had changed. Because back then, 10 years ago, I didn't know what quinoa and agave were, and, and I would wander around, I'd see these herbs and supplements for sale to cure any variety of ailments, and I would think secretly to myself, because I didn't want to offend anyone, I would think, who the heck buys this stuff? Why don't they just go to a real doctor and get what really is going to fix their ailment? Well, fast forward 10 years, 12 years, and now I spent a lot of time talking to my patients about food not just writing prescriptions. I write prescriptions for food and for supplements for various skin afflictions. And this is surprising because after all, I trained at Harvard Medical Schools where I got my MD. We didn't learn about food at Harvard. We talked about how to diagnose diseases and write prescriptions and do procedures, including Botox. And by the way, nothing will get rid of a frown line quite as well as Botox. So I don't want to misrepresent myself because all of this is important to my practice. But what's also important is food. And this surprises a lot of people, including my medical colleagues. When I go to medical meetings, the American Academy of Dermatology, I speak every year, and I talk about food, and they, they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, what are you talking about? There's no research. And I tell them, no, there is research. You just don't know about it. And so I also surprise my friends and family, especially my family, especially my mother, my Chinese mother, who, much to her disappointment, is so dismayed that her daughter never learned how to cook. So why am I talking about food? Well, for that, I have my patient to thank. Over 15 years of treating patients like this young woman, Vanessa, have taught me the therapeutic power of food. Vanessa came to see me several years ago for treatment for her acne. She had seen many doctors in the past, including those who had prescribed various pharmaceuticals, all to no avail. In fact, when she was 15, her family doctor put her on birth control pills because he told her she had a problem with her hormones. Well, he was right. She did have a hormone problem, but it wasn't her hormones. It was cow hormones. Because when I asked her what she ate, it turns out that her staples were milk and cheese and bread with meat and potatoes for dinner. So I put her on my Feed Your Face diet, and here she is less than two weeks later. She's much more clear. And you can obviously see that she's much, oops, sorry about that, that she's much happier as well. So the point I want to make is that it's not just that we cleared her skin, but for the first time, she had control over her skin and over her health. And she had a self-confidence that she never had before. And not only that, I was able to get her off of her birth control pills and avoid the cost and potential side effects of other pharmaceutical medications. And I see patients like Vanessa in my office every single day. In fact, last year, Americans spent $1.5 billion on acne treatments alone. And that's just a small fraction of the $2.6 trillion that the U.S. spent on health care last year. Imagine if we could save even a small portion of that just by changing how we eat. And so, of course, we know the medical establishment, our doctors tell us, now, don't eat saturated fat, don't eat salt and sodium, because it's going to give you heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. That's what all the doctors, public health officials, tell us about. But what's not being talked about is how diet can help cure, or at least alleviate, all of these other conditions and more. For example, in my practice as a dermatologist, I often prescribe fish, because six ounces of salmon and trout a day has been shown to alleviate psoriasis symptoms. Two and a half teaspoons a day of tomato paste has been shown to reduce sun, uh, sunburn by 20 to 40 percent. And for those of us who are concerned about, uh, about anti-aging, everyone in this room over the age of 30, eating green and yellow vegetables 
was linked to having fewer wrinkles, especially crow's feet around the eyes, compared to those who did not eat green and yellow vegetables. And on the right side, it's not just, it's not just dermatologic conditions that can respond to food, but all of these other conditions. For example, diets that are lower in gluten and dairy have been shown to alleviate symptoms of autoimmune disease and arthritis. People who eat a diet that helps to regulate blood sugar have had fewer symptoms of hearing loss. If you know anyone who's suffering from hearing loss? And, very intriguing, those who eat more curry have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than those who do not eat curry. So load up on your curry. And these are just a few of the examples. Now, I talked about writing food prescriptions. Yes, I do sometimes write food prescriptions, even for pizza. So it doesn't have to be scary or complicated. It doesn't require a lot of time in the kitchen, because remember, I can't cook. But it does have to be proven in science. And so I write prescriptions for pizza, but I tell, I tell people, put extra tomato sauce on top and extra sun-dried tomatoes to fight sun damage. And remember those green and yellow peppers if you want to fight wrinkles. So what is, what is it going to take for doctors to write food prescriptions instead of pharmaceutical prescriptions? Well, the time is ripe for this type of thinking. For example, researchers at the University of North Carolina Nutrition Research Institute are studying a field called nutrigenomics. What's that? It's the link between genes and our diet. For example, it might explain why some of my patients can have dairy three times a day and never break out once, whereas others break out terribly every time they eat cheese. Animal studies have shown that there are differences in the way that individuals absorb, process, and respond to different foods. And my hope is that someday, Doctors will write food prescriptions just like we write prescriptions for different doses of pharmaceuticals. Now, of course, this is not going to change overnight, but change starts with each one of us. So I challenge you, the next time you sit down to eat, the next time you grocery shop for your families, put some extra thought into the food you're eating, and the next time you see your doctor, ask him or her what food you should be eating, because I guarantee you, chances are very high that there is research out there to show how it can affect what ails you. Thank you.